Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and welcome to the seventh installment of my Comic Book University podcast. Guys, Professor Bill is not feeling too good today. He hasn't been feeling very good. Look, I'm even talking in the first, uh, third person. Oh my God. The Rock says, anyway, this podcast is going to try and make it a little bit short. We're going to be talking about the, the difference between Marvel's sliding time scale and DC's crisis so that we could see how continuity works between the two because I think that's fairly important to move on and this is something that I've mentioned many times in my comic book reviews or any other thing that I'm talking about and it will be referenced again I might even make a video specifically devoted to the difference between the two more than that we're going to talk about the X-Men there was actually a question posted by a guy named Troy on the Geek Fortress that's uh, go to facebook.com and look up the Geek Fortress three words and you'll see me hanging out there. You see Lewis from the Geek Fortress uh, YouTube channel hanging out there. Uh, he's actually the, the guy in charge. I'm one of the moderators. And yeah, you see a whole bunch of us there. And you'll also see a guy named Majin. <laughs> and he actually posted the correct answer before I was able to, to the particular question, why are the X-Men hated? We're going to get into that. And then the science question of the day. Uh, And this was actually specifically by Lewis. So, guys, getting right into it. Let's talk about the Marvel sliding time scale versus the DC crisis. Uh, DC always does a reboot. And they do a reboot every five years. Now, they used to always be called Crisis. Crisis on Infinite Earths, Identity Crisis, Final Crisis, all these different crises. Now, even though they had the Final Crisis, and this was supposed to be the Final Crisis, genuinely, the last one... All that meant was that it's the last one they're actually going to call a crisis. Make no mistake whatsoever, it was not the final crisis. Um, the New 52, even though that was a very last minute reboot, yeah, that was absolutely a reboot. That was a crisis. They're not going to call it that, but that's exactly what it was. In fact, a lot of times if you, and I'm ignoring Wikipedia, they're, they're a very good source of information. You know, I think that for, for comic books at least, it's usually good fans who are putting in the information while other things in wikipedia i'm not interested in looking at all i don't look up science questions there at all but uh comic book information is usually pretty good you know but uh in fact i'm going to say it's very good all right it's pretty spot on for the most part uh good props to the guys doing the video games the manga stuff the all the you know the fun anime stuff like that there now if you but aside from Wikipedia, put that aside. If you look up uh, first appearance of let's say Wonder Woman, they will specifically state well not just which Wonder Woman, but in a sense which Wonder Woman. If you look up like a Mister Terrific, you know which Mister Terrific. If you look up a Flash, which Flash, and that's a little bit different, a little bit. But you look up like Wonder Woman, well which appearance, which first appearance, because the New Fifty Two Wonder Woman is not the same as the. Uh, original Wonder Woman who came out is not the you know the new Earth Wonder Woman who came out is not the the current one that's out after the uh, the rebirth so they're they're technically they really are different Wonder Women they're from different multiverses different realities different timelines you know like a like a what if or since we're talking about DC and Elseworlds you know which basically goes to what if <clears throat> what if this course were taken instead of this course you know, Wonder Woman, for the most part, her, her basic origin is she was formed from clay and given life, and then she became, boom, Wonder Woman. You know, she grew up as a real little girl, the Pinocchio effect, right? But the New 52, that's not the case. She was not made from clay. That was actually a lie put in place to protect her and Hippolyta uh, from the idea that Hera is going to kill them because she, Wonder Woman was actually the product of a love affair between Zeus and Hippolyta. So, you know, the, so clearly not the same. It's not just, oh, her origin changed. That's a different Wonder Woman. And it's stated plainly, but it's just, you know, they're still called Wonder Woman. It, it's a great way to get a different take on the same character and things like that, but it can get very frustrating for fans, you know? Obviously, you're a longtime DC fan like myself, like Lewis, oh, forget about it. You said that, you know, you feel like a king when somebody asks you, you know, 
asked me, well, what's up with one? How come this and this and this? And she's like, oh, well, the answer is because this and this and this. And you look like you're awesome because, you know, you know <laughs> all these, you know, answers, all these different Wonder Woman. <clears throat> but it is still confusing, <laughs> no matter who you are. Even for me, a lot of times, it, it's confusing. It's like, wait, which origin was this one? Yeah, it it gets rough. So, even so, when I do my uh, explained in a minute videos, I still have to look things up for the DC characters. I still have to look that stuff up. The Marvel ones, bang, no problem because continuity is is actual continuous, <laughs> but DC not the same. So there are many crises in the DC universe. Now on Marvel, the Marvel side, even though they had the Secret War, Battle World, and all that good stuff, uh, post inversion and all that stuff. They're really just massive storylines that just set us right back to where we were before. I really don't have any problem with that whatsoever. I know there were some people, I know some of the bigger comic book channels, they complain about that. Uh, I know uh, like Rob from Rob Explained, former Marvel Explained, he complains about that big time. I know that uh, Benny, he's the, one of the biggest, I think he might be right now currently the biggest uh, from uh, Comic Storian, right? He complains about it big time <laughs> that, you know, oh, they said we're going to get something new. We didn't get anything new. I'm actually really happy at that because continuity is what Marvel is all about. Now, how do you explain certain things like, uh, you know, Spider Man? How has Spider Man stayed in high school for so long? Easy, sliding time scale. Uh, how is it that Captain America goes under ice in World War II, but is still a man out of time? Didn't he come out in the 60s? Well, yeah. In our universe, our Earth, uh, which does not have comic book superheroes running around, we simply read comic book superheroes. Yeah, buddy. Um, he came out in the 60s. But in the comic books, they never say the year that he was defrosted, so to speak. They never say the year that he came out of ice. So it was always just a couple years ago. Therefore, he's still always the man out of time. He's never really gonna get it, modern society, because that's what they need Captain America to be. Ben Grimm, and I'm gonna give an example, a uh, good example. Ben Grimm was a fighter pilot in World War II. That's right, because this comic book came out in the early 60s, The Fantastic Four. And when Ben Grimm came out, he was a fighter pilot. Before he, was, uh, before he became a thing, he was a fighter pilot in World War II. That's why he knows how to fly so well. It's one of the reasons why he knows how to fly so well. That's why he knows how to fly in combat so well also. He was a pilot, and uh, specifically, he flew in World War II. But how old would Ben Grimm be right now? How old would those rocks be? <laughs> Right? Wouldn't there be some major erosion at this time? Some some major major weathering at this point? Well, yes and no, because there's the sliding time scale. Much later on, they they changed it very smoothly into the idea that oh yeah, he was a fighter pilot during Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm, which was in 1990. Well, <laughs> that. That, that that slides, you know, they're just, they're just sliding the time scale. Everything's still the same. He's still the exact same guy. It's just, instead of in World War II, it was now here instead. I think, I don't remember a, an actual time where they stated it, but I think at one point they did also say that it was in Vietnam that he was a fighter pilot, so he wouldn't seem too old, right? So they just simply slide it when this particular event happened. You know, the birthday, you'll know, you can know the day and the month, of a hero's birthday, but the year, no, 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 unacceptable. All right, this is part of continuing this suspense, uh, the, the uh, geez, the disbelief, sus suspense of disbelief, suspense of belief. Uh, okay, that's not in my mind right now. All right, suspension of disbelief, there we go. To, you know, wait, I don't believe this. No, 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 suspend that and just follow the story. All right, here's very minor details about who they are. Suspension of disbelief, bang, we're back. Sorry for that interruption. So, yeah, like I said, I'm not feeling so well. Unfortunately, Professor Bill has kids, guys, and kids go to school and kids get sick from other kids. Sometimes the, my kids get sick and just 
it spreads. It all ends back to me. All right. It's like I'm the filter. So um, I'd like to always get the podcast out early, like to have it out on a Saturday morning. Sorry. National Podcast Day is Sunday. <laughs> that's when that's when everybody puts out their podcast. So the latest hopefully I will ever put it out is on a Sunday like today. But I usually do try to get it out on a Saturday. Sorry, guys. Just I'm not feeling great. So my mind isn't all the way here. Anyway, so the idea is that they will slide back a certain aspect of a character in order for us to understand better that this character has done all these things, the key elements that made this character who they are, bang. So, so Ben Grimm will have always been a pilot, a fighter pilot, but the war that he was in will change. So this way he does have combat experience, but which particular war? Hey, I personally, I would have said that Ben Grimm fought in um, Sarajevo, <laughs> right? Over in Serbia, going against Slobodan Milosevic, man. I would have said that instead of uh, Desert Storm. <clears throat> One, it would have brought attention to a very forgotten war. You think that Korea's a forgotten war? How many people remember what we did in Sarajevo? Like, yay, yay for us. And I'm not being sarcastic. Seriously, we did a good thing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the idea is that, you know, it would also bring it a little bit closer instead of the uh, the Desert Shield, Desert Storm operations that we did. But either way, the, the war will change, but the, the fact and what he did will not change. The event itself will not do. It's just when the event took place. Same thing with Captain America. He always fought in World War II. They're not going to change that to Vietnam. All right? It's always got to be World War II because he has to have the ideals that we loved back in the, uh, the, the 40s and whatnot when America really was as patriotic as it ever was when we were literally doing a very good thing. Vietnam was questionable, man. It's not a question in my mind. It's just, no, epic fail. Uh, I know a lot of people say uh, that was always a big contention when I was overseas. Uh, a lot of people would be like, you know, oh, America, you lost Vietnam. Yes, we did lose Vietnam, but not to the Vietnamese. No disrespect to the Vietnamese peoples out there. We didn't lose to the Vietnamese. We lost to ourselves, all right? And uh, Kent State is the biggest example of that, all right? The, 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 the movement, the hippie movement, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The idea that we just didn't want to be, it was the, the most unpopular war that we were ever in where we protested ourselves. We protested ourselves being in these other wars. Man, if we had the support, we'd have kept on doing whatever we were doing and feeding the industrial uh, machines, the industrial war machines and all that good stuff. Forget about it. You know, we beat ourselves. That's why we left. You know, was, We weren't losing. We weren't dying. We lost back at home. And they said, listen, this all needs to stop. Otherwise, you're all they getting booted out of office, and that's just the way it works. So, yeah, believe it. Like, that's what Nixon ran on. That was his big thing for getting in, the Vietnamization. Although he didn't say what Vietnamization, Viet, okay, however you pronounce it, uh, Vietnamization, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the idea of how we're going to bring ourselves out. He wouldn't say what the plan was. He simply said, I've got a plan, elect me, and I'll tell you the plan. And it technically worked. <laughs> technically worked either way so yeah he will never be a vietnam vet that's why the punisher works so well uh as a vietnam vet oh man because he started off as a villain he was supposed to be a villain he was just so popular his look and everything like that but i still remember the comics where he was literally bat crap crazy <laughs> <laughs> right where he's literally a jaywalker oh buh, 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 and scaring you know he didn't actually shoot them and kill them on the streets for that but he did shoot at them for jaywalking and, and littering and shot up a, a plate glass window or you know and all this stuff to because people were were committing minor infractions punisher was made to be crazy because that was the idea of what we had of our vietnam vets at the time um i know many Vietnam vets and I knew many more Vietnam vets. No, they were not crazy like that. All right. They, they didn't have the John Rambo syndrome going on. Not, not the ones that I'd known. And I, I've known a lot. I've known many and many of them were really cool guys, very funny guys, you know, who could sit there and talk about just, you know, bang, bang, bang. But yeah, they, they will clam up when it comes to certain things, certain questions, you know, even a fellow military guy. Yeah. They will clam up on certain things. Sometimes they'll talk to you. You know what I'm saying? But for the most part, you don't relive stuff like that. So, you know, and that's not quite the same 
not quite the same as World War II was. World War II at least has that air of we really did do the right thing for the right reason and maybe not at the right time, but we finally did. <laughs> so there's that. So Captain America will always be from World War II. He will always have gone under ice right at the very cusp of the end of World War II where he didn't know, did we win? All right. He will have always lost Bucky at that time. But when he woke up, that is part of the sliding time scale. When Ben Graham went there, when, uh, because um, even the Punisher, he's no longer, do you know how old he would have to be to have been in Vietnam? <laughs> right? So um, Punisher War Journal doesn't work in that particular regard uh, anymore. But um, Punisher Max works well. Give it 20 more years and I mean, pfft, come on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The guy wouldn't have been alive to have been, a, you know, the guy would have had to have been immortal. <laughs> so, and that kind of takes away from the air. You might as well make him Frankenstein's monster or a uh, an angel. Yeah, that really happened. So, the idea is that uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Punisher was actually moved to Vietnam uh, from Vietnam to Desert Storm. Also, that he was a Desert Storm vet. <laughs> I know it's it's just a minor thing. Where it's literally just to give you the suspension of disbelief that yeah, yeah, yeah. Minor thing. Move on. Forget what you, nothing to see here. <laughs> but the new fans can catch on easily, and older fans just be like, okay, yeah, fine, I get it. <laughs> you know. Um, there is one aspect of the sliding time scale that is a paradox and will not change, which means that this character is probably going to have to die pretty soon. And with the Inhumans versus Mutants, uh, Inhumans versus X-Men storyline going on right now, uh, post-Death of X and all that good stuff, I get the feeling that this person might go pretty soon. I'm talking about Magneto. Magneto can't really be on the sliding time scale, you know? Uh, they could change him from Jewish to Muslim and say that his family was part of the death camps in uh, Serbia. He could he could say that, you know, like the whole Kosovo conflict. How am I back on that again? But he they could say that, but that, you know, changing the, changing an origin of a character is hard and it's not really a part of what Marvel does. Retconning like that to that degree uh, changing a character's nationality like that, their ethnicity, that's not usually something that Marvel in the comics likes to do unless there's a really good excuse for it. The Nick Fury thing, is he black, is he white, that works perfectly fine because, let me just readjust, because that actually is a different universe. The Earth 616 was white Nick Fury, the, the original Nick Fury, and Earth 1610, the ultimate universe, that's the Samuel L. Jackson uh, version and yes he was actually meant to be an exact clone of Samuel L. Jackson no not literally ah, there's your DNA and I got you but anyways he was based off the Samuel L. Jackson character it's just one of the things and whatever you know deal with it but uh, personally I like it I like it a lot but you know like they're not going to make Black Panther white <laughs> you know what I'm saying they are not going to make Johnny Storm a black guy you know, they can make Spider-Man black because, well, Spider-Man is just a guy in a mess. But they're not going to make, oh, excuse me again. They're not going to make Peter Parker black. All right. That just, that just wouldn't make sense. It, none of it. None of that would make sense. And they're not going to do what I'm going to consider silly things like that. I know DC will, uh, stuff like that. You do it in the movies. That's one thing. That's not the same character. And one of these days I'll get into a really deep conversation about the difference between movies and the comics. They are not the same characters. Captain America in the movies is not the same as the Captain America in the comics because those events didn't happen to him in either universe. But for now, just topological, there you go. So Magneto, all right, can't really change. He's got to have had his family going, I believe it was Auschwitz uh, specifically, but yeah, the, the Nazi death camps, absolute horrible, biggest travesty in recorded history that you can't minimize that or you can't bring that down into something lesser someplace else. The, the, the death camps that happened in, uh, in uh, Serbia, okay, that's one thing. All right, what happened in Kosovo, uh, the whole Bosnia thing, that's one thing. It didn't happen for as long uh, 
they weren't just as bad. They, they were they were they were bad enough that there's no point in differentiating between the two. But that's really the only thing that I could think of to change it. But you're literally changing him from Jewish to Muslim, and that doesn't work. That really just doesn't work. But I guess it could. But no, I'm going to say that it doesn't work either way. The character, there's got to be some reason why he's still around because Magneto, who's, who didn't watch his family get taken away from him into a death camp, all right, simply wouldn't work. Plus, the idea that he hates Nazis, that as bad of a bad guy as he is, well, most people won't work with the Red Skull, but he specifically actually went and hunted down and uh, tortured the Red Skull. He tried to kill the Red Skull, but... Yeah, that, that would take away way too much of his character, of his persona, to do that. But he's also getting old enough that we can't keep it, that he's still alive, and that's where he was. So that's one thing that the sliding time scale, again, unless they were to do a, a Kosovo kind of thing, I don't see how they could possibly fix Magneto on the sliding time scale. So he's going to have to die, and then somehow come back a younger version of him who still remembers all of those things, I guess. That's perfectly fine. Why not? So, anyway, guys, that's basically the sliding time scale of Marvel. Now, uh, next, why the X-Men are so hated. Basically, the, the very short, simple answer is because that's the way that they were made to be. They had to be that, that way. Now, originally, they weren't quite made the same way. They weren't directly made to be that way when they were first came out, but when you have the later on uh, renditions of the X-Men, specifically after X-Men number 94 or Giant Size X-Men number 1, which came right before X-Men number 94, that's where you have the idea that these guys really are hunted and persecuted and things like that. It, yes, it did. It absolutely did exist before that. It absolutely did. But it wasn't nearly on the same scale. Uh, there, were, <laughs> there were like these five mutants and a couple other you know, a couple others, uh, stra stragglers running around. All the other ones were considered terrorists and things like that. So, but the they were actually written to be the undesirables of society, right? So if you were, let's say if you, and think about this, right? The original comic book immigrant was Superman, okay? But he didn't have to deal, now, now, in the, uh, the the movies, now they're making that, but that was never a part of who Superman was. He never, aside from having to deal with Lex Luthor in that regard, the people didn't mistrust him. He automatically had the love of the people. In fact, when they had the one DC and uh, Marvel uh, crossover, uh, Justice League versus the Avengers, the DC characters, I forget which one it was, was it Green, uh, Green Arrow? I forget which one it was. Somebody actually said, Oh, these guys are superheroes like us, except that, you know, how hard it must be for them because they don't have the immediate love and support of their people like we do. They don't have the acceptance of their people. Their people are actually critical of them. Uh, DC has since changed that. So if you grew up, you know, modern day comics, oh yeah, yeah, it seems to be the exact same way. But it was absolutely never that way from around the 2000s, mid-2000s, and earlier, all the way back to the inception in the 30s of DC Comics, of comic books, period. Right? That was never the case. The X-Men started that. No one else had carte blanche on that. It was always just the idea, oh, I'm on a foreign planet, but fortunately everybody accepts me, <laughs> you know? Uh, but the X-Men, they are in every way, shape, and form American, you know, because everything happens in America, specifically in New York City. Um, they're trying to spread that out, but yeah, <laughs> uh, the X-Men have almost never had the support of the local populace. They were not humans. They were not homo sapien. They were homo superior. They had the X gene, which would alter them around the time of puberty on, on average, on average, and usually under great stress where their hormones would kick in and then some kind of stress and then it would activate their X gene. So they would display some sort of power, you know? Sometimes it could actually change their physical appearance. Those people usually became Morlocks or totally awesome furry teleporters. But for the most part, uh, 
No, the X-Men were hated by the local populace. So think about how many people could identify with this. First off, you not only have the general geek culture, because let's, and this is one of the reasons why I hate when comic book fans call each other fanboys. You know, look, I personally, I have about as thick a skin as you're going to come across. I, as long as you don't put your hands on me, I don't care what you say to me. You, you, you're going to walk away just fine. I'm not going to freak out on you. I'm not going to go into a nerd rage or anything like that. I don't really care. Put your hands on me. I'm going to drop you like a bad habit. But anything short of that, no, we're good. We're good. I don't, all the insults, I, I don't care. Water off a duck's back, you know? But I do see how it hurts other people, and it's not cool. And it's literally like, it's literally like the pot calling the kettle black, you know? When, when you have a, a nerd calling somebody else a nerd, you know, in a not camaraderie sort of way, a non camaraderie way. It's not cool. It's absolutely not cool. Because, that's the culture that comic books have always uh, uh, brought in, you know, appealed to. Nowadays, when you got the movies, oh yeah, you'll have anybody. You'll have the, the jocks in school, you know, they're all cool with that, you know. Uh, I was lucky that I was always a big kid in school. Not a big kid, I was a tall kid, you know, and I was, I was into sports. I was into, you know, track and field at least, you know, and I hung out in the weight room all the time, you know, to, to, to pump up, uh, not, not to mass up, but to pump up for, uh, for track and all that good stuff. So yeah, I was popular enough. I was able to get away with reading comics, you know, but uh, what do you call it? I had, a, I had a very wide, diverse amount of friends. I'm going to tell you about one of my friends right now, my buddy Terrell, okay? Terrell's a black guy, okay? And Terrell and I would, you know, hang, a whole bunch of us would hang out. A huge diversity of friends, all right? But I'm going to say Terrell specifically because there's one time we both got into in-school suspension, all right? Um, a few people know <laughs> why that happened, but either way, it was nothing necessarily bad. We might have gotten into a fight in the uh, the lunchroom, but we were still buds. You know, sometimes buds get into a fight. Uh, you know, one of us has a bad day. It was him. And uh, anyway, so we both got in school suspension. Eh, whatever. Whatever, man. It happens. Uh, I think I was... Uh, was I a sophomore when that happened? I think, that, yeah, I think I was a sophomore when that particular incident happened. Whatever. And we're sitting there and we're chilling out. And you know how... You know, like we, we were kind of, we were trying to not talk to each other. At the same time, we were literally like best friends, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and um, there are a bunch of other people and it's usually the, the, you know, the really bad kids who are in there who literally got in there for actually fighting or for mouthing off to a teacher and things like that. And Trell came and sat next to me and in school, I just kind of looked and I was like, okay, here's where we're going to try and be cool with each other. So, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to try and play it off like I'm still mad at him. And he's going to try and play it off like he's still mad at me. But we're kind of going to be like, you know, cool and whatnot. Nah, Trell was smarter than me. He pulled out his backpack, opened up the, the flap, and let a couple of his comic books come out. And, of course, they're all X-Men comic books. And I was sitting there looking at this. I was like, oh, man, you had me at X. <laughs> this was before the Jerry Maguire movie came out. But literally, man, like, you know, that was the, the bond that tied us, you know? Uh, just comic books, you know, also the original Nintendo entertainment system, but either way, <laughs> all right, was, was the comic books and, and the X-Men of all the comic books, that was the tie that binds because it doesn't matter where you, it doesn't matter where you grew up, where I grew up, where they grew up. None of that matters, man. We're all the rejects, right? So if you're the black kid who grew up, uh, you know, just you're you're in a you're in a racist society. You have to deal with, you know, the idea that a cop is going to stop and frisk and things like that, or just stop you or give you a hard time, or, you know, like, there have been there have been many times, many times when I'm I'm hanging out with uh, friends who are not white, and literally the people are watching them. Like if we go to a, you guys may not know what a what a, a, a music store is anymore. There's a chance. <laughs> Um, I'm joking, of course, but you know, where they sell before there were DVDs and, and friggin CDs when there were actually tapes and people would still sell albums and they weren't necessarily vintage. Um, no, I didn't grow up during the eight track era. So, but the idea is that, you know, you go to the, the tape store where they're selling audio cassettes, all right? And we're just walking around. We're just looking at some good music and yeah, the people are sitting, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sometimes we'll split up, you know? We didn't always have the same taste in music. Sometimes we did diverge a little bit. We were still individuals. 
you know, go after my, uh, you know, my, my Latino friend, you know what I'm saying? Like actually just watching him, you know, watch one of my black friends, watching him, just, you know, they're doing things and trying to act nonchalant. So, come on, man, ain't fooling nobody. <laughs> it is, you're not fooling anybody, you know? You walk over here, then switch and walk over there. We know you're following me, <laughs> you know? But nobody would follow me. Why would nobody follow me? You know why nobody would follow me. You know, all right? And when push comes to shove, man, I could have looted the whole damn place <laughs> because nobody was watching me because they devoted their, their lookouts to these people of ethnicity <laughs> and I, who apparently have no ethnicity, that's the way it's looked at. Uh, yeah, man, forget about it, you know? So, <laughs> you know, but that was the tie button. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. If you came to this country and your English wasn't so great, okay, you, you understood the idea of being ostracized. There were only a certain group of people you could hang out with. Nobody else wanted to hang out with you because they couldn't understand you. You know, or, or you ate different foods or you smelled different because of the different foods you ate. The, the things I would hear people talk about, you know, saying in regards to, oh, man, yeah, the, those Indian people or anybody from the, the, the Desi population, you know. Oh, the Indian people, man, they always smell like curry. I can't even get near them. That's, wow, man. Like, all that is is that's called something new happening. You're telling me that, you, like, really? It's that bad? Because I don't think it's that bad at all. You know, um, just all these different people who are ostracized. Let's take it a step further. People who were gay, people who questioned their uh, their sexual identity, people who had any kind of questions about who they were. You know what I'm saying? God forbid, God forbid you were an X-Men. Okay, maybe you didn't have a superpower, all right? But you did have an X gene in a sense, in the social term, you know? Anybody who grew up in any way, shape, or form differently, you could relate to the X-Men. And that's exactly what the X-Men appealed to, right? Anybody who had superpowers, you know, the question is how come X-Men were ostracized, basically, and people like the Avengers and the Fantastic Four weren't? Well, because the Avengers and the Fantastic Four got their powers by accident, <laughs> you know? But the, the X-Men, no, they were born with it. So realistically, it's just the power of plot. It's because that's what the comic writers needed in order to sell their comics. That's what they they based the X-Men off of. You know, forget about the cool powers that they had. That was to make sure they were superheroes and they belonged in the genre. But they were different. They were very different. But the Inhumans, did I say that? Yes. But the Inhumans were made to be the people who hid from society. The X-Men were made to be the people who didn't hide from society right they weren't aliens they were humans unlike the inhumans even if the ones who did hide like the morlocks they uh they were still in they were still a part of society they were still there they were still close enough they could spy they could see what was going on the inhumans at one point moved to the moon <laughs> you know they, they put adeline on the moon the blue area of the moon where there's actually oxygen and that's a really good story i'm going to get into one of these days the pre the the Kree scroll war and the pre the reason why the Kree and the scroll were so sick you know the scroll were actually the good guys in this imagine that but the writers needed the x-men to be those people who were outcasts because that's why that's what appealed to the people and the x-men quite literally were the number one selling comic forever it's one of the reasons why so many people feel betrayed right now and the reason why, what is it, Extraordinary X-Men number 18, I think I just did the review of a couple days ago. By the way, guys, yeah, I am sick. I actually, I'm sorry that the comic book reviews this week are coming out very slow. They're trickling. I actually filmed all of the comic. I've got three that I already put out. I uh, already filmed every single one of the comic book reviews that I'm going to do. The problem is <laughs> that... Uh, uh, actually editing them and things like that. It's very hard for me to stay awake and do all that with all the other things I got to do. You know what I'm saying? So, sorry. I'm going to try and get them all out. Uh, I would hate if I, if I filmed something and I didn't actually get it out, but whatever. It's life. But I'm going to try and get out all my comic book reviews. Sorry. Please be patient with me. Um, took care of Dylan. I got the Batman out. That's probably the most important one. <laughs> but... <clears throat> to finish up on the question of X-Men versus Inhumans and what are we looking at? Ah, oh, already 35 minutes. Let's hope it'll be finished by now. 
the idea is that they, the writers needed that because it's obvious that the comic book characters uh, appeal to the nerdy class, you know what I'm saying, the geek class. But specifically, the X-Men spoke directly to them. Okay, they weren't just an aspiration. They were already there. My, you know, sends the powers, minus the powers. They were already there. So that's why the X-Men are hated because that's what was needed. All right, and uh, again, uh, sorry, yeah, the uh, Extraordinary X-Men number 18. Uh, please go and check out the review for real because if you're an X-Men fan, I'm telling you, the whole Cyclops was right thing, this gives a lot of honor back to old Cyclops and it, it, ex it, it makes young Cyclops feel exonerated from the crimes that old Cyclops has committed. Well, some of them at least. And it's really, it's, it's separating him from the original Cyclops, the final real break from him. And man, fantastic, or at least the latest break from him. But it's a really fantastic comic. And I know it's, like I said in the, the, the review, it's probably just going to be one of those comics that people are just going to forget about whatever. But for me, this will actually be like uh, Extraordinary X-Men Volume 2, issue number 18, will forever be for me one of the pivotal moments in Cyclops's long history because young Cyclops actually breaks out onto his own and understands. This is about where he's going to go and join the champions and he owes it to an inhuman. So that was actually very cool. That's Dennis Hopeless who did that story. I just, I read that comic and I was like, you know what? I don't like to have, to follow a lot of people on Twitter, but I'm going to follow this guy on Twitter and you can find me at comic book uni or just look up professor bill on Twitter. Uh, I, or just go to Facebook and you'll see all this stuff anyway. So, bang, that's the reason why. So, Troy, I hope I answered that question very well. <laughs> Guys, to finish off the science question. Now, I'm doing... Uh, there were other ones that were voted higher than Lewis's question, but Lewis did ask multiple times. <laughs> so, there's that. And it leads me to something else that I really want to talk about. So, I'm going to give you the easy... And the, basically, the question is, how does a Green Lantern store energy in his ring? Well, <clears throat> to break down the question, how come it wasn't asked how the large battery wasn't stored? How come the small battery doesn't store? How come only the, the ring, the small ring, because it's so small? Miniaturization, easy. But, excuse me, oh, I'm so sorry I'm coming out. I'm so sick to you guys. <clears throat> but... Uh, and and even in, in my videos, I usually try to edit out my breathing in my comic book reviews and things like that because I don't want any of that a podcast not so easy to do. Anyway, yeah, there's my breathing. So um, the power ring all right, gets its power from the power battery. It gets a charge, a smaller charge. All right, it used to be it was a 24-hour charge. Jeff Johns retconned that in a very beautiful way and said, no, the average use of a Green Lantern battery will allow the Green Lantern to function without recharging in his personal battery for up to about approximately 24 hours. That's where that came from. But if he greatly extends power, then yeah, it's going to go a lot faster than 24 hours. You know, continual use and all that good stuff. Major heavy use. So there's that. But basically it's just a battery. The, the easy answer is it's basically just a battery. You got the main power battery that gets its energy from the residual willpower that exists in the universe. <clears throat> and then you got the smaller batteries that through, uh, another, they just explain it as through another dimension, the energy goes to the individual batteries. And then by contact, the or, or very close proximity, they're not actually, they're just putting it in. Anyway, it could be contact also. The, the idea is that the, the basic contact of the, the much smaller ring, what I should actually wear my ring. I'm going to totally wear my ring for this. But <laughs> any excuse to put this puppy on, you know? And uh, my fingers weren't so big. Uh, but yeah, pinches a little bit. Anyway, to, you know, actually charge it, you know, with the oath, bang, it, it, it stays inside the, the ring. So that's the easy answer to the question. But let's make the question a little bit more difficult. How do batteries actually work? <laughs> this is actually really important, guys. This is actually important. This is a, a huge part of what I kind of want comic book university, what I just want the world to be, in a way. 
how batteries work currently is very, very outdated. Now there's a chemical reaction inside batteries, right? You have the cathode, all right, and you have the anode. And in between you have electrolytes, all right? These are the, the chemicals. You have the sulfur and you have the, uh, the, the sulfur in the water. And over here you have the lead and the electrolytes that are generated from in here will transfer energy from the negative cathode to the positive anode. And that will get the flow of energy. Did I actually just reverse that? Sorry, the pot, there's actually, there used to be two theories on how it works. One would say positive, one would say negative. Uh, excuse me, the cathode is the, the negative. <laughs> Can I just erase this? The cathode is the positive and the anode is the negative, but the energy flows from the positive to the negative. So it's actually the negative that gives you the energy that we would consider to be positive. You know, um, um, a layman would say, oh, there's positively a charge. There's a positive charge there. It's actually the negative charge. It's the result of the negative charge. That's the direction it's going. It may seem complicated. It's actually not. It's just my inability to explain it as well as I would like to. But either way, so you get, that's, that's all that you're really doing there. And then there, there, there are wet batteries, there are dry batteries. A car battery is, is wet. You got the electrodes in there like that. Chemical reactions don't necessarily, chemicals don't necessarily have to be wet, right? There's a chemical reaction in everything, all that we do, you know, everything out there. Uh, of all the sciences, chemistry is the most basic of those, right? And physics is a good divestment from that, but it still relies on your knowledge of chemistry. So <clears throat> basically a, a battery is exactly that. You have a circuit hooked up and this is your power supply. All right, this, this is your power source. To have a proper circuit, you need uh, a resistor to quantify how much energy is gonna get through. You have to have a capacitor to essentially keep the energy going through, uh, and then you have the battery that's actually going to supply the energy in the first place. And then whatever, and then a part of that circuit, and that could literally just be walking around in a big old circle. And then you have to have whatever item it is that you're trying to power, be it a light bulb, be it a radio, be it, uh, whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, anything, anything that you're trying to hook the battery up to. And minus a battery, you would have an actual power source like plugging something in, like your blender. You don't necessarily want to use a blender, uh, a battery with a blender. You want to use just a power source, um, excuse me, a power source like an electrical outlet. So both of them are considered a power source, an electrical outlet or a battery. They're all power sources. A potato could be a uh, a uh, power source, you know, if you ever did that experiment when you were a kid. <clears throat> Guys, the reason why I say that batteries is archaic because uh, when I was working in electrical engineering, this was always a thing, and this is known in STEM, science, technology, education, and mathematics. You could add or detract of the education. Either way, it's still going to be science, technology, mathematics. The idea is that batteries are due for an upgrade. The, the main reason why solar energy isn't the big thing in America is because of politics. And that's just hands down. And that's on both. And, and please understand something. All right. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I despise. In fact, I don't think that's a good enough word. I despise both parties. And they should literally both just fizzle away. Because I don't do the whole lesser or greater of two evils things. All right. I don't do that. I don't subscribe to that at all. So... I, rather, I say, if you're both corrupt, you both do whatever you want to do, all right? I don't like the idea of living in an oligarchy where corporations are actually in charge, right? Um, they don't have my best interests at heart. They absolutely, hands down, don't. When you actually follow politics and you look at this, you agree with me. Trust me. You agree if you follow politics. Uh, if, and I'm saying trust me because I think some people don't. Either way. The idea is that there is, and there, not only is there, but there has been something of a war on science for a while now. All right? Not an actual, like, I know people like, you know, war on Christmas. Ain't a war on Christmas, man. What's that old song? Happy holidays, happy holidays. Yeah, people have said happy holidays since there was black and white TV. All right? So happy holidays is perfectly fine. Get over yourself. But the idea of a war on science is in the sense of keeping people uninformed so that bad decisions can be made that are in benefit 
of the corporations who don't care about anybody's future. All right, it's very uh, Ayn Rand sort of mentality, Randian mentality of look out for yourself. Um, I'm going to prove that Randian doesn't work because that's not a society. And two, Ayn Rand, when she died, please look up her politics if you don't know, not even just her politics, her theory, right? Atlas Shrugged, a very famous book. I know you know it. Even if you haven't read it, you, you, I'm sure you've heard of it and seen the really cool cover. Uh, Ayn Rand died on Medicare and Social Security. So she didn't believe her own philosophies. There's that. But <laughs> the idea is that science really is something special, all right? It is the future. It has always been the future, all right? There's no fire. There's no human survival without science, all right? My wife and I were like, <clears throat> I'm so sick, it's ridiculous. I literally sat down when I could have been working, trying to do a couple more of uh, uh, explained in a minute videos, but I'm just sitting down after we finally put the kids to bed. Today, my wife and I are just sitting down, we're watching, uh, YouTube, after I'm finished with all my news uh, shows that I that I missed from yesterday, the weekend is like my break from the news for the most part, um, I just put on some YouTube on the big TV, and we're watching Primitive Survival. Very, very cool. I love this stuff, because in my time in the military, I learned some survival techniques. I was infantry, uh, infantry and truck driver. Those were my two MOSs, 88 Mike and 11 Bravo uh, in, the, in the Army. <clears throat> but... Um, what do you call it? I uh, so so I did learn some basic survival techniques, and I was also in the Boy Scouts uh, when I was a kid. I loved, I loved, and I still do love uh, that. I, I like just getting out, and you know, in Canada it's a lot colder than it is in Jersey, <laughs> so uh, you know, getting out and actually practicing your survival techniques uh, depends on where you are, <laughs> you know. Uh, you got to worry about heat a whole lot more up here in Canada than you do in Jersey. So, you know, I, I love the idea of just doing stuff like that. But th we, we absolutely couldn't. Have, you know, when you look at the different ways to make fire and things, the different ways to purify water, the different ways to build your home according to the, the, the environment that you're in and what's a temporary home and what's a, a long term home and the reason why you have to make both. And finding water in the first place again filtering it boiling it how you how are you going to boil water if you don't have if you just land up in the middle of nowhere how are you going to make a, a vessel to so you know and the idea of making tools right you actually have to make tool if you need a tool to chop down a tree you have to make the tools necessary to build the proper axe to chop down a tree and things like that so it's amazing when you really get into that idea that you know, if, if everything just dropped, the original, you know, engineering that existed in the world, most of us would die out in the wilderness, <laughs> all right? Not just a boredom from not having uh, the ability to recharge our, forget about our power rings, our iPhones, you know, or, or our, our, our Android phones. No, the idea that you don't know how to do these things, right? I can, for the most part, I'm not as good as this guy, you know, that I'm watching on TV, but we're just sitting there and just looking, it's like, Ooh, I never would have thought of that. Okay, how do you do that again? Let's rewind. Oh, dude, that is so cool. Yeah, man, I want to, you know, like this summer, we're going to we're gonna try that. You know what I'm saying? Go out with the kids and just hang out and do that? Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I love doing stuff like that. But that's the original engineering. That's the original sciences. And there is no reason for science to ever stop. There's absolutely no reason. It is our future, hands down, bottom line. Seeing a pick for... Uh, Secretary of Education, uh, uh, Betsy DeVos, like this. This is, look, I don't, I hardly like any choices, any picks ever. You know, saying I'm very critical of stuff like that. And this particular run is bad, but the worst that I've ever seen is Betsy DeVos. Look, I believe in God. Okay, I do. I genuinely do. There's, there's no reason to dispute. Okay, I, I've studied comparative religion. I could probably tell you about religions that you've never... I could tell you about sects of religions that you've probably never heard of the religion itself. All right? I can go into exasperating detail, you know? Um, I am actually a very religious guy, but I am also a scientific guy. I believe in evolution. All right? In my opinion, there's no... Belief in evolution is... Even that in and of itself is a silly term. 
all right? We may not know the exact finite details of how evolution works, but it makes a whole lot more sense than just we were dropped here. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> so the idea that um, inertia and gravity <laughs> and the proximity of the moon and the sun to the earth along with the size of the earth, which has more to do with gravity than anything else, um, is the reason why we have an atmosphere that doesn't escape into the, the, the nether, <laughs> all right? Makes a lot more sense to me than angels holding up stuff. And the idea of just the, the reason for uh, thunderstorms makes a lot more sense than even when I was a kid. Dad, what do you mean God is bowling with and, and Saint P with the angels and St. Peter is taking score? What, what do you, what? Like, it just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, every time that you hear thunder, God made a strike. When we're kids, that's fine. All right, as adults, it pays to know that the earth is not flat. It really does. The, the flat earthers and stuff like that. Getting, then you're going to go into conspiracy theories, and it's always the idea of, I figured it out without any actual education in the fields. Guys, I'm going to tell you this right now. The reason why I'm getting into all this is because this, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I really got off topic a little bit on the same topic. I said that politicians are the main reason why we don't have uh, the latest technology in batteries, uh, excuse me, in solar solar energy. The second reason is because our our research into batteries is really far behind. We make advances in sciences all the time all the time but batteries we've been kind of at a a bit of a pause because it's not even a pause more like just we can't figure out what's going on there are many great inventions that we're still waiting for many but a lot of those inventions depend on the upgrade of batteries guys battery technology even though you'll see different you know from heavy duty batteries to alkaline batteries to lithium batteries all these different kinds of you know nickel cadmium and things like that I don't care which chemical which which element that you're using and which uh, which kind of chemical reaction you're looking for I don't actually care we need to move on from this kind of technology guys I'm not in the sciences anymore all right I, I work with uh, businesses that are that want to involve the sciences or that have the sciences already involved and merging businesses and things like that. And I work in Comic Book University. <laughs> One I get paid for, the other I don't. Guys, if I were still in the engineering field, I would be trying to move into research just because I would love to be that guy to make that breakthrough in the latest battery technology and actually make it a real breakthrough, <clears throat> not just some silly little marketing thing. Guys, uh, Albert Einstein, all right, and various other scientists, but Albert Einstein particularly, the discovery of radio waves was a huge thing. Okay, today I say radio waves, you have a very good idea of what that means, but let's say if I were to call them arugula waves. No, arugula is actually a fruit. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a food and we can't, no. Let's not talk about arugula. Let's just say a, a bugula, okay, a bugula waves okay you would have no idea what the heck I was talking about all right but they were called radio waves back then Einstein no, no side nobody knew what to do really with these waves it's just like oh this is very cool we discovered a new form of uh, 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 blah, radiation all right we found a new pattern on the electromagnetic spectrum we found something new dude how totally cool is that that's ripping man well, they also realized that, you know, what they could do, they could actually communicate, they could send communications over these things. And they, and mind you, they realized that any form of communication is possible with radio waves, okay? Any kind. But the technology had to be developed slowly to do these, these individual uh, forms of communication, all right? Starting with the ham radio, moving on to actual radio, moving on to television, uh, moving on to color television and then moving on to internet and all sorts of different uh, forms of communication like that. The scientists realized that all forms of communication were possible here. But they weren't interested 
and things like that. It actually took intelligent businessmen, hi, to come along and market these things. This is one of the reasons why I switched from engineering, electrical engineering over into the marketing field because when I realized that, when I learned the history of this stuff, <clears throat> I, by learning science and then meeting certain people, I realized how important it is to spread information to the world on technology, on engineering, on the sciences. I realized just how crucial and detrimental it really is to us as a society. Guys, in the end, good businessmen came along and they said, hey, so let's, you know, let's check this out. You got these, uh, these, these radio waves and you can send communication over. So can I send like my picture, you know, a picture of myself over? Yeah, it's just, you know, the idea like it would be really hard to do things like that and whatnot. And we're not interested in that. We're interested in the discovery of it. Well, what if I were to get some young budding uh, scientists? Could I get them to build a device to do that? Yeah, you absolutely could. Yeah, go ahead. I, I recommend you doing that. So these businessmen made the personal investment to go and find young budding college graduates and things like that, young hungry scientists, uh, engineers mostly, who would come over and start working on building machines that would send a picture and things like that. And they said, you know, listen, the, the technology isn't quite there yet. We could start doing a, a way where we can transmit and receive our voice. They said, oh, okay, yeah, that'll work. That'll work, that'll absolutely work. So they made the ham radio, bang, you got short wave, right? But the FAA came along and decided to regulate, okay, because when, when, when push comes to shove, you, you, do we need it? Not really, but it's there, it's life, that's, that's where we are at this point. Uh, the spreading of misinformation, whatever, anyway, you know, the idea that maybe there could be some spy communications going back and forth, I mean, like, this is kind of a big deal, you know? And these things can absolutely be interrupted. You know, it was one of the things that we learned in the military. It's one of the reasons why we still like to use wire uh, transmissions. Because the only way to hack a wire transmission, a landline, is to actually hack into the wire itself. You have to find the wire, hack into the wire, and then listen that way. Radio waves, you can intercept those things all the time. <laughs> you know? Um, that's why those have to be encoded. You don't really have to code uh, a land transmission because you hide those things and pff, you're good. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. You don't have to code anything. Anyway, back into the, the science of it. With the FAA regulating things like that, mass sales of uh, uh, shortwave radios, ham radios, they worked, but not on the level that they wanted to because you had to go out and get an actual license to. And, 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 and if you're talking on the radio and someone else starts talking also, you're like, hey, what's your license number? And if you couldn't give them a legit license number, okay, buddy, I'm going to have to report you to the FAA. Can absolutely do that and you would because you're, you're just jamming up you know frequencies you, you obviously don't know the rules of you know etiquette talking on and whatnot and so okay cool so some ingenious businessman came along and said is it a possibility to make it like what exactly is reg regulated all you're basically saying is that the, the speaking is regulated anybody can listen on a, a shortwave radio but you have to have a license to talk that's basically what you're saying right yes well, what if we were to make a radio where there was only the receiver and not the transmitter? And thus was born AM radio and eventually FM radio, right? So talk radio, music, and things like this. This is how this got to And what a great contribution to society, to culture, to who we are, the dynamics of who we are as a people all over the world. Because the invention of radio receivers... Yes. So it wasn't science. It was scientists who invented it, but they didn't have the idea to do this stuff because they just weren't interested. Scientists are interested in actually developing the technology. The place of the businessman is to extrapolate what they can from this technology and think the uses that you could do. Can you build me this? Because I want something that's going to do that. Eventually, black and white TV, color TV, <laughs> color TV where the, the, the cables in the back wouldn't get distorted because you decide to use your your vacuum dear god uh the vibrations alone from the vacuum would actually mess up the cables in the back and you'd have to go and get your cables fixed so yeah move the tv outside i have to vacuum uh pour down a reed <laughs> but that's how the spread of information has always worked scientists invent something why because it's there 
because it exists. That's the thing. So that's why we have to fund our scientists. Because then some intelligent businessman will come along and, and, and be able to realize, be able to derive something from these inventions, say, what, do you make? what are you working on? Oh, cool. What can I do from that? You know, so, or I, I, need, I want somebody to be able to do this. Does the technology exist? Hey, I'm going to fund you to do so-and-so. That's why the funding of scientists is so crucial. All right, we wouldn't have TV, we wouldn't have video games, we wouldn't have the internet, hello, internet, we wouldn't have radio, we wouldn't have TV, anything, any of that, if it wasn't for the funding of scientists. So guys, if we went back to the whole plantation thing where everybody looks out for themselves, all right, sharecropping and things like that, yeah, you work on your farm, I work on my farm, we don't have time, have time to invent the automobile because if I start working on the automobile, I can't feed my family. And that's the way it works. Rather, the idea of introducing money instead of the barter system, the monetary system instead, now we can actually do things, okay, listen, I don't have time to work on a farm, but you do. Can you work on a farm for multiple people and we will give you money that will always be transferable to anybody so that you can derive the things that you need, all right, like medical care, how about that, <laughs> all right, from other people? So that, and, and you provide, you know, food and we provide milk and just bang. That's what, so that this way, oh, if we're all working on a farm, you've already got carrots and I grow carrots. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I really want those tomatoes that you're making. Yeah, but somebody else already gave me carrots. I don't need more carrots. So you can't have tomatoes. That sucks. Now what, you got to go and try and trade with somebody else who hasn't so that now he can't have carrots. Like just, ah, uh, that's just, it doesn't work. On the small scale, sure. On a larger scale, sorry. Communities cannot grow on the barter system. They have to work on, on, on the monetary system. God, now I've moved into economics. Professor Bill, baby, comic book university. Guys, the reason why we fund scientists, all right, and have society the way we are is so that we can evolve as a people. Automobiles, all right, space exploration, all that stuff. Oh, what do we get for space exploration? I don't want to make this video any longer than I have to. All right, what do we get from underwater exploration? I don't want to make this video any longer than it has to be. Every single thing that we do, what do we get from that? Hey, maybe you could be the ingenious entrepreneur who comes up with the idea. Hey, what exactly can we derive, derive from these things? Huh, interesting. Maybe offshore uh, mining of asteroids because that's where metals come from. Yeah, we no, we dig in the earth to get them. Yeah, those are from meteors that, that landed a long time ago that had metals in them, asteroids and things like that. That's why we have the the, the metals that we currently have in the earth, but they're depleting. But there's pleth there's plethora in space, so let's let's fund you know let let's try and make a space bridge. Let's try and fund it so that we can have uh, the easy access to. Uh, space shuttles so that we could go back and forth and, and mine uh, metals so that we're not depleting the earth and, and, and deforestation just to get metals all over the place and destroying our ecosystem. <clears throat> we need to fund the sciences for our future. And guys, I'm telling you right now, if you, even, maybe you're younger, you're in high school or something like that and you're thinking, no, I'm not smart enough. I'm going to determine if you're smart enough right now in the very easiest way, if you are getting a B or better in math, only math, go for a, a degree in the sciences, okay? Just do it because I can assure you, you're fine. Even if you just do a degree in mathematics alone, guys, scientists don't always do all their own math, <laughs> all right? Because we got better things to do. I still think of myself as a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer anymore. I was never a scientist. But... Uh, what do you call it? There, there's always a need, all right? The mathematics easily transfers over to other things. And I can assure you, I can absolutely assure you, you will always be able to get a job in teaching. I don't care if it's university level. I don't care if it's high school or lower level, all right, from fifth grade on level. The fact, the absolute fact of the matter is, in mathematics, you clearly will, will always have a job, all right? Even just, like I said, even if it's going to be the fallback of teaching, all right, when, uh, when I was doing substitute teaching, 
I know that uh, there was a, a job that came up for in that school for English, all right? And the English teacher, right, who was leaving, there were 10,000 applications from all over the country for that position. I'm not saying don't go for an English degree, but be smart and understand what you're going for that English degree for. Why do you want that English degree? What are you going to do with it? If you're saying teaching specifically, that had darn well be the fault, better be the fallback. That better not be the main reason because we have plenty of English teachers. All right. And the criteria isn't great exactly for an English teacher. Actually, the criteria is expanded because they, they can weed out people big time. You know, you can have somebody with a master's degree teaching in a high school because, hey, the demand is great. You know, why not? But a guy with a bachelor's degree in math, you are guaranteed a job. Absolutely guaranteed. And there is a lot more than just that. But guys, back to the battery thing. This is the single hands down great i'm talking look the the hey, the large hadron collider and all that stuff look all that stuff that's going to help you know moving towards the the creation of the better battery all right the ultimate battery it'll never be ultimate but the better battery that we have today that can actually hold the charge or or you know a greater charge than what we've got which is what we need which is what we need so that we're not wasting the energy that we're getting from solar or god forbid all the other uh Oh, unethically terrible energy choices that we're making now. We could survive. Look, Las Vegas is independent of fossil fuels. They use solar energy and they're using um, what you call it. The, uh, the, the, by the end of 2017, they're going to be completely fossil free dependent because they're going to be using hydroelectric uh, all the way from Hoover Dam. <laughs> all right. All the way from Hoover Dam. That's far. The solar energy. Um, all that good stuff. Yeah, you might be saying, oh, yeah, man, uh, Las Vegas, they're, they're in the desert, so they can do that. It's not about the heat. It's about the sunlight. So a solar power calculator will work in Antarctica as long as it can see the sun. <laughs> okay? Because it's the radiation, not that I went over this in the last podcast, I believe. It's not, heat is usually, is usually the, the secondary thing, all right? Unless that's the main thing, like if you're burning wood, you're looking for the heat. Uh, just as much as you are for the light, but especially the heat. Um, so we're not talking about the secondary residual uh, uh, runoff of energy. We're talking about the main use of energy here uh, will usually result in some heat being being put off also. They're looking for the radiation specifically. Guys, if you can get into the sciences, uh, you get into the maths, whatever, you get into the sciences, guys, you figure out not just the Green Lantern battery, but you figure out the new battery Okay, not just the copper top idea and whatnot, not the alkaline, all that stuff. The new technology for the battery. You do that, you will win. I promise you, you will win a Nobel Prize. All right, because that will be like the big thing. That would be like curing AIDS. Okay, that's what that would be like. All right, that would be like the guy who cured polio. And what a great guy. Please look him up. Amazing. The guy who made penicillin. All right, that would be like Marie Curie. All right, you you would literally be like one of those Einstein, Tesla type people. All right, the Isaac Newton types, because that is the next big break break blah, breakthrough that we so desperately need. Please get out there, learn, put your money. I'm not saying don't go for the arts if that's what you want, but yeah, led to the the fall of Greece. Right, that they were so happy with what they were doing with the sciences that most people going towards the arts and they didn't have the sciences going like they needed to. And yeah, there was the decline right there in Rome. Don't even get me started. <laughs> Don't even get me started. There there has to be the balance. There has to be a balance. Really good rush song. <laughs> All right, the uh uh what do you call it? The philosopher and the plowman. <laughs> Each uh I can't remember exactly the words for it right now. But plus, I don't want to get a citation for <laughs> plagiarism on here. But um, yeah, please, please look into the sciences. And you could eventually be the guy who leads to us doing the Green Lantern Ring. Absolutely. Because uh, Alan Scott's is magic. Uh, Hal Jordan and everybody after that, they're all science-based. This is science-based. This can be explained through theoretical sciences, which means that it's possible. It absolutely is possible. 
Wouldn't that be great? Guys, get out there. Please, please support the science. Don't even just support the sciences. Be one of the sciences. Go out there and try and be an electrical engineer. Go out there and do something great in society. I can assure you the jobs are out there. And you can even make your own, make your own jobs. Partner up with somebody who's good with business. You want to be an entrepreneur, then be an entrepreneur. You know what I'm saying? Just something along those lines. You have to have the mind for being an entrepreneur. You have to have the the knowledge to be a uh, uh, a scientist. I don't know that you can necessarily teach entrepreneurialism. And I don't know if you can naturally be affiliated or uh, have the natural affinity for the sciences. One you can learn, one you just kind of have. Uh, that's just my opinion on it. But you can absolutely learn the sciences. Please do that. All right. It, it's better than getting a job at Walmart or or any place. That, even better than getting a job at Costco. It really is better. All that good stuff. Please go out there and do that. Anyway, guys, uh, find me on SoundCloud. I'm on Podbean also. <clears throat> uh, find me on YouTube. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, God. Jeez, I'm ending this just in time. Uh, all of it, Comic Book University, three words. Um, either way, go and check me out on YouTube. By all means, please. You can find me on Facebook also. Uh, just look up Comic Book University, three words on Facebook, and you will always be updated on every single one of my videos. Um, all those places you can find me on Twitter. I try to upload every one of my videos there also. Uh, Google Plus, everything. Like you'll you'll find me around. <laughs> I'm around. And uh, anyway, guys, yeah, Professor Bell, Comic Book University. Guys, class dismissed.